I'd like to welcome you all to the Masters of the Universe 1987 movie panel. Woo! Quickly at this time, I'd like to remind everyone to please turn off your cell phones. And uh, photography is allowed, but please no flash photography. Thank you. Now, today we are honored to have four very special guests with us. They'll be sharing their experiences working on the Masters of the Universe movie. And starting from my left, if you could please introduce yourselves and let everyone know your role in the film. I am uh, Gary Goddard. I'm the director of the film. I played Blade. Yeah! Woo! <laughs> yeah. Hi, I'm Meg Foster. I played Eagle Lynn. Woo! My name is Rich Fonder, uh, best known as Big Boy. <laughs> Now, to begin, I'm going to start off with a group question. How did each of you first get involved in working on the Masters of the Universe film? Uh, I had directed the Conan Sword and Sorcery Spectacular at Universal Studios, and uh, it was quite a hit, and Ed Pressman, the producer, had seen it. And I had just finished writing the screenplay for Tarzan and the Ape Man with Bo Derek and Miles O'Keefe. I was uh, looking to direct, and I had directed a lot of uh, stage productions. Anyway, I met Ed, and uh, he loved Conan. He went to see it again. He came back and said, I think you're the guy, but I'm not sure that Mattel will approve you, and they have approval rights. And at that time, I was actually consulting with Mattel on another line called Captain Power. And, uh, yeah. Uh, and I was doing some other things for them, and I said, I actually think they probably will approve me. And Ed was like, well, why? And I said, because they actually know me from this other stuff I'm doing, which they did. And so that is how everyone always says, when you did your first movie, how did you wind up directing a $17 million movie for your first one? That's how. It just <laughs> meant, was meant to be. So that's how I got involved. Um, Gary Goddard had the good sense to cast me. <laughs> <laughs> With one condition, what was it? Well, he wanted me to shave. Well, I had a choice. I didn't have to shave my head, but it, otherwise it would have been time and makeup. And uh, skull caps at the time really weren't what they are now. Um, I had my time and makeup later on. Uh, I, I did a part on Star Trek Voyager, uh, Maj Kala, King of the Kazons. I did five of those. That was three and a half hours in makeup and an hour and a half out every day. Uh, Blade, on the other hand, was about 10 minutes in makeup, uh, <laughs> except for our six weeks of uh, location work in Wilmington, where I would be on the freeway in rush hour traffic just shaving my head and looking at it. <laughs> it was before it was fashionable, so I had a good time doing that. <laughs> yes. I actually remember calling and saying, I think we're going to catch you as long as you shave your head. He said, fine, no problem, we'll do it. So, that's not what I remember. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, it, it was very exciting. As it, as it turned out, small world. I ended up taking over the uh, Conan sword, sword and sword and sorcery spectacular. The last three years, I got to come in and re-choreograph it and redo the show. I don't know if you ever got to see the last. One. I did. I went to the last one. Excellent. It was, Excellent. Last show. Yeah. Okay. It was a good show. And you, know, you could win a, a 
uh, an appearance in the movie, and you had to go to Toys R Us to get a, a sweepstakes form, and I made my mom take me, and she allowed me one stamp. I wanted to send in a bunch, and she said, you can send in one, I'll give you one stamp. <laughs> and I don't remember when that was or how much time went by, but we got a phone call at the house one night from an agency that so they were the, the judging agency for the contest. I was a finalist. The FedEx letter showed up, I think, the next day or two, saying I was a finalist. And my parents signed a bunch of forms, and a couple days after that, we got another letter saying that I had won. So. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so the schedule slipped during the summer for a number of reasons. Ken was going bankrupt and all kinds of things were going on. And he was supposed to be a boy in the crowd in one of the Whittier sequences. That was, it was going to be very simple, he was going to come in. But as the schedule slipped, uh, we had to be on the stages. By the time it all worked out, logistically, we were now on Eternium, on the stages. And actually, most of us making the movie had forgotten all about this obligation to tell. <laughs> about in the middle of all this, in the middle of all kinds of things were going on, Two executives from Mattel come, they have to meet with him and say, you're three weeks away from finishing. You have to put him in. We made a promise this was the next week. I said, well, we're an attorney now. You know, it's not like a, a, a little, a little boy is going to wander around the throne room. You must come with something. I said, okay. I got with Bill Stout. He said, okay, we need to put this kid in. We have to do it. We're an attorney now. So Bill came up with Pig Boy, and we got the wardrobe. He could, I mean, if you think about it, as a kid who won a Super Six, he got a much better experience. Instead of boy in the crowd, he actually came to Hollywood, he had facial appliances, a real costume, real thing, and he got a name that everybody remembers in the credits. <laughs> As opposed to boy in the crowd, which is what it would have been. So that's what really happened. That's how he wound up being a big boy. <laughs> Now, Gary, for the film, you created many new characters like Blade and Sarad. Can you tell us what led to these new characters being created for the film? Yes, um, I'll try and keep it brief. But when we started the movie, Mattel, the toy people, wanted you know every bloody character in the canon <laughs> in the movie. And I said, well, A, we don't have the budget, but B, it's hard to tell a story that way. And I took them through the Star Wars scenario, the number of characters in Star Wars, how you can follow about that many characters in a movie, and not too many more, without creating a lot of problems. And then for the secondary characters, I said, rather than just use the ones, wouldn't it be neat to create a few new ones? And they actually liked that. that they, oh, that's a good idea, new, new ones, let's do that. So uh, we created new characters, and I wanted some new characters to open up the universe a little bit. And also, uh, to be honest, in the first live action movie, I was a little afraid of um, some of the characters they wanted which some of you know. Uh, and also, remember, the concept came to me. Ed Pressman already commissioned the first draft script. So the idea of them coming to Earth uh, gave us the ability to limit the number of characters in a way that in no way reflected on the actual universe of Eternia back home. All of those characters still exist. It's just these are the ones that went through the, the, you know, the, the uh, distortion uh, time element and wound up on Earth. So uh, that was the reason. The reason was to create some new characters that we could use on Earth that would uh, work well for the story, I think. Now, Meg, you played the seductive... Oh, one more thing. We, we also had to kill off one character, and the toy guys absolutely said we could not kill off any existing toy line. So another reason we created <laughs> Sauron was so we could actually kill him off. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. Nice. <laughs> Now, Meg, you play the seductive sorceress Evil Lynn in the film. There seemed to be a bit of a romantic connection between her and Skeletor throughout the movie. Did you create a backstory for your character beyond what was on the page? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not saying did you hook up with Frank. But what I'm saying, <laughs> did you and Frank do a little bit to elevate what was on the page and make them? Yeah. No, we just no. worked together. <laughs> Um. <laughs> <Love> each other. <laughs> no, I, I think that um, if I recall properly, that um, we do know that Evelyn felt that it was all hers. But um, I'm sure that she had great um, passion for Skeletor and respect. But um, surely Eternia was meant to be hers. <laughs> Ha, <laughs> ha,
<laughs> as Blade said, I had my own agenda. <laughs> but actually, I was actually truth. Truth be known, Blade saved my life. Oh, oh yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But do you remember? This is a this is taking a right hand turn. But do you remember when I fell going down ah, the stairs? Yes, I do. I had to, I had my cape, which was very beautiful, but about 35 pounds, and I had to walk around Skeletor, and there were these three steps that led down to the front, and Blade and um, Beastman were over there. And actually, in actuality, there were these big drops. Do you know where the smoke was rising? There were actually, how many feet was it? About 15. That's, that's about, about 15. And I tripped, my cape got caught on the corner, and I kept going. And then my feet went out from under me because the cape was attached. And I had my breastplate on. Thank God. Thank God. <laughs> I had an excuse. I had an excuse, right. But it made, me, it made me back heavy when I got caught. So I zoomed like this on my back, and I was headed for the the ledge. And um, and Blade put his foot down and I stopped. <laughs> saved, saved my life and my costume's life. I remember it more romantically, I think. I thought we had done it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, you didn't but you had to help me get up because I was so I was like a turtle on the lady. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. Lady. 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 And I was like, Maggie, you okay? Okay, good, let's do it again. <laughs> well, I'm not sure whether to thank Gary for this or not. Uh, yeah, there, was, there was so much creativity going on. Uh, a lady named Julie Weiss, I believe, was our, our uh, you know, costumer, or costume designer. And uh, I originally was in uh, all in surgical rubber from head to toe, uh, with gloves, with boots. I had no exposed skin other than you know my face, so, so thank you for having me shave my head. Otherwise, I, my body wouldn't have been able to breathe. And my chain mail, um, uh, it was actually ten six-foot lengths of pipe cut into quarter-inch pieces. So I was carrying around some fifty feet of pipe with me all the time, and um, it. Uh, it, 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 it was not a user-friendly costume. I actually had uh, a lady who was the assistant and Julie write me a letter and said, I've never done this for another actor before, but I'm just concerned for your safety. And I, you know, like, you know, I uh, talked Gary into letting me cut the sleeves off, so I actually had some, you know, breathing room. And um, it was kind of nice, too, because, you know, when, uh, in the scene with He-Man when we had our sword fight, and then, you know, he, he picks up Sarah and throws him. I actually caught him. So uh, the, for a minute there, there was there was a whole lot of activity going on. He was bouncing so right off me, and I was I was saving his life too. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, they they would never tell me how much it actually weighed. I just knew it weighed a lot. <laughs> but look pretty. <laughs> <laughs> at the end of the day, uh, actually, at several points of the day, whenever we get a break, and I could you know get rid of some of the outfit, I would take my boots and just pour it off. I expected a trout to come out of them some night. <laughs> oh, yeah. They were always full. <laughs> Ew. <laughs> uh, on the costumes, Julie had really only done kind of, Julie Weiss has already only really done um, contemporary type pictures before that. And her take on the costumes was um, challenging, but she did a great job in execution. Again, Bill Stout came to the rescue. Bill, Bill and I had known each other for years, and you know, doing a film like Masters of the Universe is different because you're creating an entire world. That's the costumes, that's everything. And uh, so what happened was Julie's first take on the costumes was problematic. Bill designed uh, his versions. She objected at first and I said, look, you're still getting the credit, so it doesn't matter. Why don't you just make these happen, which she did. And uh, so everything, everything uh, all's well, but ends well, right? But yes, it was a, it was a, there was a bit of anxiety at one point when we first saw some of the initial costumes. But I think in the end, everyone, I mean, Eva Lynn looked fantastic. Everyone really looked
But there are little things, you know, as you go from page to, you know, three dimensions that uh, you may not think through if you haven't had a lot of that experience. For example, when I had my, you know, over top of the chain mail was the armor. Well, I had these spikes right here like this, which right away took any shoulder rolls out of the table. And I had to kind of be careful that I didn't turn my head too fast so I could put my own eye out. <laughs> Details, I'm, details. <laughs> <laughs> Show business, yeah. Anyway, uh, the, the eye patch was interesting too because I knew I was going to be uh, you know, fighting opposite Dolph Lundgren, you know, a tremendous athlete who like he also likes to swing hard. And, you know, <laughs> so I'm kind of going. I need I need some you know uh, some perception, and so I persuaded them to cut you know put little pinholes in it which you guys couldn't see but it made all the difference. Otherwise, I would have one eye, literally. So, it's just little things. Thanks. Now, Anthony, you choreographed all the sword fight scenes in the film, right? The, you, um, the scene that you have with Dolph Lundgren and then playing uh, Frank Langella's stunt double at the end of the film school play? Uh, I did, it was, it was a lot of fun. Uh, I got to train Dolph for a month. Uh, again, Dolph, you know, he was a champion kickboxer, a tremendous athlete, he'd just come off of the uh, Rocky picture. Um, and so I had, you know, a really great clay to work with. Uh, we trained for a month and then I hadn't seen him for a month because he had started principal photography and Dolph was in pretty much every scene at that point. So I kept talking to the coordinator, Walter Scott, who I've worked with a bunch of times, uh, you know, since then, and saying, when, when can I see the location, you know, so because I always like to factor. If you guys are going to come to my sword demo later, we're going to talk a lot about, you know, the location being a major part of, you know, being another character in the scene. Um, and say, so when can I see the location, you know, I'm work out the sword fight, you know, so we can really put together a good story. And Walter is very, oh, yeah, we'll have lots of time. What, what do you think is the first thing we shot when we arrived? <laughs> we had about an, I had about an hour with Dolph, and I hadn't seen him in a month. So uh, it was a real testament, you know, to his ability to focus and concentrate and put together what we did. Um, the final scene, uh, we had, uh, I was doubling Frank Langella, uh, so because Dolph knew me and knew he could really focus on his performance and not, uh, uh, you know, have to worry about the lack of rehearsal that we weren't going to get with Frank Langella. So uh, we, put, we put together a very nice power staff and sword routine. Um, the problem was, uh, they didn't tell me until right before we shot, that the decision had been reached that that fight wouldn't happen until after he'd gone through his transformation. So now he's wearing headgear that is a cross between the idol of a ball and the New York City skyline. <laughs> I had done with the staff. Details, details. Don't bother me with details, darling. This is odd. I couldn't do any of that stuff, so we had to do a very fast, uh, you know, what can we do? Um, you know, Gary uh, lit that beautifully, you know, the, you know, with the lighting and everything. I thought it was still very effective. But I was so pleased when he, you know, the power staff was broken and he went back to himself and got the whip out of sword. It's like, okay, now we can fight. Nice. <laughs> now, Rich, how old were you again when you won the contest? Uh, eight. Eight years old. Eight oh. years old. Do you remember what your reaction was when you found out that you actually won the contest and you were flying over? Um, I. I Surprisingly, I have I have vivid memories of, of the whole uh, experience. Oh, I share, but uh, yeah, um, I remember being being shocked, overwhelmed, um, and and I remember my parents being very skeptical because you know, these agencies that were calling strange names, and, you know, didn't, you know. So uh, yeah, I just remember being very shocked, um, and we were anxiously anxiously waiting um, on the on the timing. The timing was changing, so trips were changing, um, but there was a lot, there was a lot that went into the, the upfront and the waiting period. Um, I had to have letters, I, I had to have letters from my doctor saying that I was, you know, healthy enough to, to do this. I had to have letters from my school, my teacher, my principal um, saying that, <laughs> that I was, you know, able to be out for two weeks and, and work with a tutor while I was in uh, California. Um, so there was a lot of stuff that had to happen on the upfront before, you know, before we could ever even go out there, but I do remember a lot of, a lot of anxiety, and, and uh, it didn't help when we got to the airport and our, finally our flights were canceled too, so it was fun. Aww. Aww. <laughs> Thanks. That picture has been stolen by show people. <laughs> <laughs>
Now, it's been 25 years since uh, the Masters of the Universe movie was released. Um, looking back, how do you feel about the, the movie now? Uh, I'm still actually pretty happy with it. I mean, you, know, you don't get to tell the audience what you went through to get the thing on the screen, but it was very unique. Some of you probably already know the stories, but uh, you know, uh, little did we know that Ken was going bankrupt. Uh, we also did not know that, that the He-Man toy line had plummeted right before the movie started. We found out halfway through because Mattel was desperate to get the movie out, and uh, I think Mattel, on two or three occasions, actually, the, actually made the payroll for Ken because uh, I would arrive on the set at 8 in the morning, the uh, Teamsters were already standing there going, we didn't get our paychecks, and I'd call Elliot, the producer, and go, okay, what's up? Well, they know the paychecks at Ken, and said, okay, okay guys, well, we're all here, we're here for the day, why don't we, why don't we use the day and still try and get the shots? I totally understand that by the end of the day, you don't have your checks that you're not going to work, but why don't we work today, let's get through the day, and Elliot will get you the checks by the end of the day somehow. And Elliot did. Only years later did I find out that, that it's because Mattel stepped up. Mattel actually stepped in and went, okay, we'll write the check for this week, let's just keep going. So uh, uh, while Mattel was a little problematic during the script phase where they had uh, uh, approvals on everything, on every costume, on, you know, uh, they, uh, they were very supportive on the other side. When push comes to shove, they made sure that the production kept moving forward. Um, uh, yeah, the funny story is that uh, before, before uh, when we were in pre-production, they hadn't yet got the numbers, not like today with, with all the computers, they hadn't got all their quarterly numbers in for he -Man. They knew the line was a little bit in trouble, but they weren't worried, they hadn't conveyed this to us. When we started, uh, like they said, okay, He-Man can't kill anybody, He-Man can't, he can't shoot anyone, he can't do this, he can't do that, and I'm like, okay, you guys gotta go see Terminator and a few other movies because, <laughs> This is a live action movie, so, you know, uh, we took a lot of uh, heat that the, that our, our, uh, our guards looked a lot like Star Wars, which I don't think they did because the Star Wars were white and ours were black and all that stuff, but nevertheless, the way I got He-Man to be able to kick some butt was I created a robot, you know, that's why there's sparks when those guys get hit, so, so all of you and all the young people would know that He-Man was not killing people, he was just bashing robots, that was, basically how we got that through. Otherwise, I'm not exactly sure what He-Man would have done <laughs> during the course of this movie. Um, anyway, so uh, so when we're in the script phase, design phase, okay, he can't do this, he can't kiss the girl, he can't this, he can't that, he can't that, okay. And then halfway through the movie, I get a panic call. You know, John Weems and, and Joe Morris and the Mattel execs are coming to the set, they need to meet with you for 10 minutes, and I'm like, okay, come with us, come with us, we go behind closed doors. They're like, the sales dream, man, are plummeting. This has to be a hit, this has to be a I said, well, you know, you, you said he can't kill anyone, he can't, this John Wing says, he can kill, he can maim, he can break, he can that lost footage? <laughs> Yeah, this time now we are going to open up the floor for questions. Oh. Use the mic there. Oh, okay. uh, thank you all for coming. I don't know if this one. I can hear you. Okay. <laughs> uh, for Blade, there were only three characters made into action figures actually for the movie. Yours was one of them. Did you ever get your action figure? And uh, for Gary, uh, T2 attraction. Uh, Universal is awesome, so thank you very much. But have you ever been on the Transformers ride yet? And what do you uh, think of it? Only one of you, only one of anybody. <laughs> one of the nicest moments in the film. I watched it again uh, two nights ago, um, and uh, it was I, it's still very effective. I, I I I've been lucky enough in my business to travel all over the world. Uh, Horses are a passion of mine. I'm on horseback in 11 countries on five continents, and uh, we happened to be in Australia. And um, there was there was a young boy. And he was about 11, and he found out that I had been in Masters of the Universe and played Blade. And his brother, it was his favorite character. And his brother had since grown up and gone off into the military and you know served his country. And all of his toys went on to. Uh, you know, his younger brother, and he was just absolutely thrilled. So uh, I had this you know, huge fan 
uh, who was third generation um, in, in his family, who still loved the movie. I, I, I really enjoy the movie. I think it's very, very touching. You know, well done, sir. Thank you. Oh yeah, oh, I got an action figure. Uh, it did look it looked just enough not like me so that I I never got any residual. Uh, production do Hollywood hardball. Um, and I still have it in uh, kind of one sort. That's what's uh, uh, did did we bring it? Oh we brought it, so if you guys uh, come by the signing table later or the demonstration, uh, I'll, I'll show you my action figure. But I'm I'm hoping we can get a new uh, you know, uh, classics. Masters. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Well, uh, <clears throat> I'm very glad to hear that that line resonated with you. That uh, basically, uh, I think I can say it now, it's been enough years. Uh, Frank Langella and I would rewrite the script at night because the script we had was approved <laughs> by Ed Pressman and we wanted to give more depth to the characters. like. Evil and, and Skeletor. And I told Frank when we started, I said, I know the script right now just says, get him, kill him, seize him. <laughs> but we're gonna work through it, we're gonna make it much better. And the entire, uh, the entire ticking clock and the transformation of him into a god, uh, that was all me, and the flying disc was all me. And that line, because I actually wanted the picture to say something to kids, and I thought, to me, that line, was the key. If it, if it reached any, anyone young and you realize you're the only one of you in the universe, you have something to bring, that was what I wanted to underlay. So I'm actually really touched that that's the line you picked to, to say right now. So that's great. Uh, but what was the real question? T2 and then what? T2 and then what? Transformers ride. Ah, Transformers, yes. Okay, so you know I also did the Spider-Man 4D ride. I was awesome. Adventure. I like the Transformers ride. It is exactly the Spider-Man tracking system, scene for scene, effect for effect. The only thing I think is lacking, I think it's good, by the way, I enjoyed it very much, and I, I liked it. The difference between Spider-Man, granted I'm a little prejudiced towards Spider-Man, but the Spider-Man, you had a, a sequence of events unfold, each were different, with different characters, and different things happened. You got propelled the wrong kind of story. The only thing I found yeah not great about Transformers is that every scene was much the same. It was this, it's a great big charging robot coming at Union. So, but that's a minor complaint. As a ride, I thought it was a, a good ride. I thought it was a very good. Hey, first off, I can't wait. Uh, I can't wait for. <laughs> I can't wait for the movie to come out. Blu-ray. It's gonna be awesome. Um, yeah. I was gonna ask. Um, I know you guys. Uh, the stories behind, like all of the you know, approvals and budget issues. I was gonna ask, if you like would like how Transformers and other now properties coming into franchises, uh, if you had the budget you wanted and the time you needed to make it, what would you have done differently? What would you have liked to a movie like to have like more of an effects or anything in the budget? Well, from my perspective, if we had digital animation and not stop motion, I think I would have brought Battle Cat through. Yeah. probably wouldn't have run or Orco through in the first one because, you know, with a movie, you're trying to reach a wider audience, you want to bring them into the universe. And I think for fans, Orco of the animated show, Orco was very, but to bring that in, into the first live action one, especially then, might have been problematic. With stop motion animation, it would have been very, very difficult. So you have to understand, you know, two characters that got ruled out then were, were Orco and, and Battle Cat because stop motion expenses, all the things, and we were on a very tight budget yeah. for that time. So, uh, but I think Battle Cat would have been great, yes. you know, you know on, on Earth, with today's digital capabilities, I, and it would be not only doable, it would be fantastic. So, I think that'd be one change. Overall, uh, there, there's not a, a whole lot else that I would change, except the digital would make all of the effects sequences a little better. Not not all of them. Some of them yeah. are pretty good. You know, some oh, of the yeah. miniatures are better, but uh, but uh, you know, some of those air centurion things would, would be pretty cool. In CGI today. Uh, but the idea was, by the way, the sequel, because what I was hoping was it would be a big enough hit we do a sequel. My idea was always when we went back to Eternia, I wanted to make that much more of a <clears throat> an Eternian version of like Lord of the Rings, much oh, more nice. of an entire universe with areas that we had not yet discovered yet in the animated show and stuff, and really make that a, a whole kind of a quest. 
that was that was what I hoped for had we gone on to the next uh, next movie. Excellent. <laughs> uh, well, Billy, first of all, consummate professional. Uh, that guy went through three, three and a half hours of makeup every morning, never complained. Never complained when he had to wait, and there was a lot of waiting. Meg can tell you that there was a lot of waiting. <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, so from my perspective, uh, Billy was, uh, you know, easy to work with, fun to work with. Uh, Always have a joke to tell. Some of them a little off color. But... <laughs> <laughs> I remember sitting sitting in his trailer with him as he was having his, his makeup done, and just being my sister and I. My, my little sister is, is in all these pictures with me. Apparently, uh, now that I go back and look at him, I'm like she was she was there all the time. My parents are. But she was there. <laughs> she actually she... asked me to put her in place with you, but I said I can't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I remember. I remember. Vividly sitting, sitting in his trailer while he was getting his makeup on, and just laughing and laughing and laughing. Yeah. Well, I imagine you guys are aware that uh, you know, Billy comes from a circus background, mm -hmm. you know, and, uh, from generations really. But um, just for all the work he's done you know, with little people, I had the pleasure of working with him in a play shortly afterwards down at the music center. And uh, touring with fellow, you know, just and he wouldn't like you saying shortly afterwards. Uh, <laughs> uh, he went there, <laughs> but uh, as Gary said, you know, the consummate professional and a wonderful sense of humor. Um, one of the best stories I, I think I ever heard about the weight that goes on in film because it's just part of it. Um, one of the first things you learn as an actor is how to pace yourself because what's important is that your performance gets on screen. Not that I was ready six hours ago when I was supposed to work and it's ten hours later and now it's your turn and everybody's in a hurry. You've got to be able to do that. But uh, someone, uh, this was involving Peter Rory, and they uh, you know, came up to him and apologized because he'd been sitting on the set for hours. You know, and uh, he said, uh, no, it's all right, you know, uh, you pay me to wait. Uh, the acting I do for free. <laughs> 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 no way. I I do remember because um, because the character that I was supposed to be had a name, and I remember seeing the drawings, and this is what you're going to look like, and okay, the character had a name, Mata Shai or something. <laughs> so I remember sitting in the theater um, and, and the credits rolling up, and and sitting there even as a kid, like big boy, you know, <laughs> <laughs> right? And you know, awkward child growing up. You know, and all your friends and all your friends. <laughs> <laughs> when the, details, details. <laughs> when, the, when, the, when the film opened, um, and I don't remember who did this, but they actually rented out an entire theater and threw me a party, and I could have as many people as I want to to the local theater, and, and so I was surrounded. And so, um, but no, I wouldn't. Um, I, I brought some actually some pictures that um, a few weeks. A few weeks after getting home, with this beautiful album of pictures showed up, and Aww. and so you know you don't get to see it up close in the movie really, unless you on DVD it's awesome when you stop it. But I've got some uh, amazing pictures that I wouldn't I wouldn't trade this for anything. You know this this was brilliant. Um, you know I've got pictures sitting there going through the makeup. Um, the the one thing I remember though too really vividly is 
the, the night after we did the filming, just the burning of my face after all that stuff came off. I remember being in our hotel room and just sitting agony. My face was on fire from that mask coming off. That's what I was gonna say. The principal and doctors, little do they know, <laughs> we're gonna bring him out there. We're gonna put goop all over his face. We're gonna do a mask. We're gonna glue it to his face. We're gonna rip it off. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I, I wouldn't trade it. A couple a couple years ago, I was I was sitting in a in a meeting with several higher ups at my at my office, and um, we were just having a normal conversation and. At one point, one of them turned to me and said, what do you think, pig boy? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it was then I knew someone had Googled me, so oh. <laughs> I wouldn't, wouldn't trade it. Oh. <laughs> All right, we have time for just three more questions. Um, I'm an actor, so my question is a little hardy and nerdy. Um, but I'm, I guess for Megan and Anthony, like, what, what did Mattel kind of provide you as far as backstory, and what did you guys make up? I really kind of, because both of you were really present in the movie and had, you know, just made an impression. So I feel like you probably, hopefully, had pretty intricate, interesting backstories to, to create with Gary, and I, I just want to hear about that. So. I'll go first. Okay. Um, Mattel didn't provide anything. <laughs> uh, the, uh, but as you said, we're actors, and as an actor, I know you can appreciate this. Uh, we there's always the script first because the script is you know the first um, treasure that you mine. Uh, you have a good director who uh, you know guides you with things uh, and leaves you alone when he likes what you're doing. Um, Gary pretty much left me alone most of the time uh, unless he had something very specific to tell me. But uh, I, I had to conclude that I was a mercenary. Uh, I was good at it. Um, you know, I had these various accoutrements, but mostly what I had were things that were up close and personal. So uh, I wasn't shooting people from a long ways away. I didn't have ray guns and things like that. Uh, yes, but that's still up close and personal. But for the most part, it's, um, and that's the whole thing with the sword. You know, when you're blade and double swordsman, you are within sword's point, and it's very personal. And, you know, one of my most telling lines was, I've waited a long time for this. <laughs> and I gave myself the backstory that probably I lost my eye to He-Man, so it was all enormously personal. Um, and, and again, enjoying May, May's performance uh, a couple of nights ago. I was just looking at her and the amount of character that's coming out where she's looking at Skeletor and how deeply she feels for him and how he constantly disappoints her. <laughs> uh, all that resonated just so much. And, uh, you know, it's a beautiful performance. <laughs> Story of your life. <laughs> but uh, basically, you know, we supplied what, uh, at least in my case, you know, I supplied what invested me with a character that, uh, you know, I could you know, wrap myself around and commit to it. And I really enjoyed being a part of it. And it was, uh, I've, I've been waiting for that uh, second film, so. I'm going to work, boss. See you, cool, see you, cool. <laughs> You're up. I'm up. <laughs> um, well, it's very, no, nothing from Mattel, but, um, you know, Gary wrote it. And, and, um, and everything really sort of transpired between the actors. And if Gary wanted something, he'd guide us to it. He and Frank spent a lot of time. Um, Frank was consummate. And uh, we all know how brilliant he was because he's such a present, talented man. <laughs> and, um, but insofar as Evil Lynn, really, um, I trusted Gary to tell me if there was something that I wasn't doing or suggest take it this way or that way, which he would on occasion. I, I found that I thought the film was so wonderfully cast and every um, head of every department was so thorough. I mean, we were doing something that really hadn't been done before and that was quite remarkable. I mean, it was breaking new territory. And as you heard, you know, there were the, the crises which one would find out about in little daily ways. Um, <laughs> you never knew who was going to be going <laughs> during the day. But, um, but insofar as um, Eva Lynn, I, I must say, you know, um, Julie Weiss and Don Scott, I mean, the, the, the wardrobe, the costumes were brilliant. 
And you know, um, when you have, when you're wearing what we wore, no matter how encumbering it was at the time, and we, we all at moments, they say, actually, we all adjust. <laughs> hold, on, hold our weight, I'd make my breasts go up. <laughs> She's very talented with that. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, we, but we were, we were, were semi-constructed, and it, and it lent itself to our characters, actually, because we had to be, which is what I found very interesting, is that in wearing this beautiful costume of Evelyn, I carried myself in a very specific way. I had to, and it made me focus in a very specific way. I mean, one would say that, yes, I had a 35-pound cape, but it as well made Evelyn. I mean, it made Meg think about Evelyn. And, and in that way, it was very stylized. I mean, everything that we had to sort of be sure of. And because, <laughs> and, Body in motion. <laughs> body in motion, especially with you know, you know like, but um, it was really very thrilling. Mm -hmm. well, it, it truly was. And we all, we all had our little trials. <laughs> mm -hmm. We, uh, I mean, part of directing is casting well and and giving the actors a space to, to do what they do, and then yeah, guiding as as you go through, and sometimes you know, conference on the mound to say we well, think about this, think about that, but ultimately you try and cast the people that you feel are right for the role. And in the case of, of these two here, he had the physicality right away just to make sure he could have the acting chops, which he did. And then I had to make sure he'd shave his head. <laughs> Those two things. But the, but the last one was the least important. But it was the first one important. Meg walked in, and I'm sure you all remember her eyes. And, yeah. and I knew, really, from the moment she sat down, I was like, well, actually, what I was saying was, please be able to act. Please be able to act. <laughs> <laughs> but she could. So that, that the whole, uh, you know, Frank Langella and I, I mean, he would come in with snippets from Shakespeare or Moliere, and I'd come in with a scene. We'd, we'd, you know, we'd talk through something. And that night, after the shoot, I'd go and I'd write up the scene for the next day. Because the only way we'd get it by, because, you know, we were far beyond Mattel approvals or any other approvals at that point. We're just going to try and make something that we think will really play and, and have emotion and drama. So, uh, and part of that whole thing was, Frank definitely had a backstory that he and Evelyn probably had something at one time, no more. Mm. But, uh, and uh, Meg was in on that. She may not recall, but she was in on that. And that subtext you felt, yeah, did suggest it, but be very careful, because again, remember how we started when we tell you, you, you couldn't have gone ahead and said, hey, guess what, you know, back in the past, Skeletor and Evelyn, they were, you know, <laughs> it, was, it was all subtextual. You read into it. So my question is probably more for Gary. It's about the um, supplementary documentary materials that you were producing about the movie. Yes. Um, I know that you had some archival documentary materials and then you were supplementing that with some new footage. Uh, I think that we um, heard about at PowerCon. Um, what's the status of that project? Is it going to be released independently on its own? Is it possible for inclusion in the Blu-ray in October? Well, we pushed very hard. I'm not going to... Yes, I am. I'm going to be second negative on the Warner Brothers people. Brian Singer, who's like my best friend, agreed to do a, a to interview me on a kind of a director's thing to do a new cut on that. We had that. We had all of the documentary that Roger made. We had tons of stuff. All Bill Stout's designs, everything. And Warner's basically said, "No thanks. We're just going to put the blue in." Oh, yeah, exactly. That's what I thought. <laughs> you know, I, it did, you know it, they were going to get this for next to nothing. I mean. You know, we were willing to basically give it to them for the cost that it had taken to make the documentary. And so I was a, a bit mystified, actually. So it will not be on the Blu-ray, courtesy of Warner Brothers. Uh, but the documentary is going to be released separately. Roger's going to do that. And uh, there is a... There is a possibility of, of a book that's going to be done. And if the book gets done, then Bill's work and a lot of the photographs and stills, a lot of stuff you've never seen before will be in that book. Follow up on that. Um, speaking of things we've never seen before, is it possible that that will include the extended ending of the movie that we never got to see? Does that live somewhere? I'm not sure. I, it does live because it was edited. It's, it's, it's a complete scene and it's, it's the farewell scene. For sure. He's talking about. At the, I have one regret as a director. I let the, the studio talk to me after the first screening. Um, the people. 
there was a blackout. We, we faded to black at one point, and people thought the movie was over. And about a dozen people got up to leave. Actually, we were still going to do the farewell scene. And so management at uh, Canon interpreted that to mean you got to, you got to, but what they neglected to realize was in the first two screens before we made this cut, people actually were in tears. Because I had the equivalent of the goodbye scene from Wizard of Oz. When Courtney says goodbye, she has a separate goodbye to each of them, just like the lion, the tin man, and everything. And that moment really worked. And I fought and fought and fought, and I finally allowed them to talk me out of that. And I don't think the end of the movie's ever been the same. So I would love to get that, but you can see how cooperative Warner Brothers is. I, I, I don't know if we'd ever be able to get that unless no. uh, Steven Spielberg or somebody said he wanted to see it. Yeah. <laughs> then it would get done. Start tweeting Steven Spielberg, everybody. <laughs> of the female fan base. It took me two years to convince my boyfriend, now, is, now he's my husband, that I was actually a fan long before we met. And um, I watch the movie regularly. I'm just amazed at how you made the film real. It wasn't campy. You were dedicated to the part. And it meant a lot to me watching it because going from the animation to the movie, it was nice to see that someone took that Real, someone felt that that needed to be realistic, and so I want to say thank you for taking that personal touch, giving that personal touch, taking the time. Um, my question is very simple. What do we as the fans need to do to get a number two? Very <laughs> <laughs> social media waiter. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure. There have been three attempts so far, all different with different directors and different writers. I read one of the scripts, and unfortunately that one had about... 60 characters in it, so I, I don't think that would be the movie you'd want to see. I mean, it sounds great, wouldn't it be great to see all these guys? But seeing all those characters on screen for, you know, two pages each, you know, doesn't really make a great movie. It looks like a commercial for the toys, you know? So, uh, but that's, uh, that's one. I don't know what the other two are. I've only read that one. So I'm not sure. There have been uh, three attempts. There's one more. They're, they they got the guys that wrote... Uh, wrote yeah, right, Predators. Yeah. It just seems like to me as a fan that the only thing Mattel's interested in doing is making toys and making money, and they're not putting two and two together. You make a good movie, we're going to buy the toys. So. I agree. I, I think uh, Sylvester Stallone, of all people, after he made one of his movies that was a bomb, said, you know, no one starts out to make a bad movie. You know, we all yeah. start to make a good one. We just don't know. So I think even Mattel wants a good movie. The problem is you've got to find a filmmaker you trust, and the filmmaker has to believe. And I'm glad you noticed, because if we, I really tried, Frank, these people, we tried to make it real, not a campy, ha, 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 isn't this funny version of He-Man. And uh, I think that's, you know, every single fantasy, sci-fi, action-adventure film that we like, we like because of that. And the only ones that we don't get really the ones that are on purpose, that we know that's the idea, you know. So, you know, I agree with you. I hope that whatever happens next, that whoever comes on board will treat the material with, uh, with you know, treat it seriously, make it real, make it real for the fans. Thank you very much. Right. Unfortunately, we have now reached the end of the panel. We want to give them all a big round of applause. Gonna be, give me another, gonna be, give me another, gonna be, give me another, I tell you go, go down.